Well, welcome to Myeloma Boston 2016. Um, I'm Stephen Russell, and we just had a really interesting session on myeloma um, environment biology insights. Uh, we had three presentations. Um, the first was from um, Madhav uh, Dodatkar, and he was talking about um, a really interesting discovery he's made that uh, very often in Mugus, which precedes myeloma, um, the specificity of the antibody that's produced is against a lipid. And moreover, he's discovered that you can actually um, provoke the expansion of the Mugus clone by um, stimulating with the lipid antigen. He's unfortunately not able to make this session to give us an account of his talk, but we do have Suzanne Lynch here, uh, and we also have um, Dirk Hoser, uh, who both gave very interesting presentations, and maybe I can hand over to Dirk first to talk about his uh, presentation on the evolution of MGUS2 multiple myeloma. So many thanks for the kind uh, introduction. So my talk is about uh, what brings up mitral myeloma uh, over the uh, asymptomatic stage from the monoclonal gammapathy. And we profiled uh, a large cohort of patients, uh, in total a cohort of 2,000 patients, uh, went in and we investigated whether it's the factors which are present upfront. So at the stage when you do uh, the analysis on your asymptomatic myeloma patient, which drives progression, or whether some genetic alterations appear when you do longitudinal samples, so samples at asymptomatic and at symptomatic myeloma stage. And uh, the, for us, really interesting finding is uh, that the main factor is which drives the progression is what is initially there at asymptomatic myeloma stage. Um, you, in many patients, do not find any clonal aberrations which uh, grow out. But as myeloma is, this can, of course, happen in a subfraction of about 20% of patients. So this is fascinating insights into the Darwinian evolution of the myeloma clone, um, indicating that uh, the important things have already happened very early on at the stage of the, um, the benign condition that precedes myeloma. So and uh, then Suzanne was, um, uh, she gave a very interesting presentation with new data on the genesis of myeloma bone disease and the importance of matrix metalloproteinase 13. Can you just give us yeah. a summary, Suzanne? Yeah. First of all, thank you for inviting me to um, present our data, which we generated over the last, um, I would say, 10 years. Um, as you know, we are very interested in multiple myeloma bone disease. Multiple myeloma can be uh, induced devastating bone disease. Up to 80% of the patients develop lytic lesions, and 60% of the patients develop fractures. So it's a very important topic that we cover today. So our laboratory focused on factors that uh, contribute to the development of lytic lesions, uh, factors that are secreted by the, by the multiple myeloma cell. And we identified that MMP13 that was, uh, I would say, so far not known to have anything to do with multiple myeloma. We identified that metalloprotein A is to be secreted from by the multiple myeloma cells. And what happens when this enzyme is secreted by multiple myeloma cells, it induces osteoclast fusion. So the result is that you have giant osteoclasts that are very active in resorbing bone. So as a consequence, patients who have high levels with MMP13 um, have extensive lytic lesions. And we showed in preclinical studies and animal studies that when you knock out MMP13 in multiple myeloma cells. That means when you reduce the secretion of um, this protein, you decrease development, or in animals, you can block the development of bone disease. So this is very exciting because inhibiting MMP13 um, might contribute or might help us in the future to better treat bone disease or even to prevent bone disease. Also, it might be a marker that we predict patients who have high levels of MMP13. Again, it is uh, at a stage um, we confirmed that in animal studies, so we try to do clinical correlation, but it's a potentially very interesting and exciting target for multiple myeloma bone disease. And one of the remarkable things um, from your presentation was that the matrix metalloproteinase does not need to be active. 
That is in correct. order to in order to induce this bone destruction. Yeah. yeah, that was a result that surprised us really. So we assumed as we detected high levels of MMP13 in multiple myeloma cells that due to the enzymatic function of the protein, uh, there is a fusion of osteoclasts. But we identified that uh, the effects of MMP13 on osteoclasts are independent of the enzymatic activity. That creates a little bit more work for us to produce or to synthesize neutralizing antibodies and not using enzymatic inhibitors. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to translate that into clinic, but again, a promising approach. And the connection between your presentation and Dirk's presentation was that you were showing that it's the um, proteins secreted by the myeloma cells that drive this bone destruction. And Dirk was showing how these myeloma clones evolve from the MGUS to the, to the myeloma stage and acquire the ability to cause bone destruction in the process. And it's very interesting to consider how you can actually, at a mutation level, think about the connection between those two processes of a non-destructive clone becoming a clone that's capable of destroying bone. What you have to take into account is, of course, also the number of myeloma cells which are present. Um, I mean, in MGAS or even in asymptomatic myeloma stage, it's much fewer myeloma cells being present. So this would fit uh, perfectly with the concept that you have, an um, uh, due to the accumulation, uh, this change in the biological behavior of the cells. Not at a genetic level, but rather at, due to the fact that you have just many more uh, cells which produce exactly these factors. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's a very kind of, you know, valid point. Um, we are not sure whether there is a switch in the uh, quality of the cell, that an MGA cell produces less MMP13 than a my multiple myeloma cell. Um, we don't know exactly, but I think what is really important is that an MGAS, for instance, you have only few cells and maybe the production of a low amount of MMP13 is not that critical. Whereas when you really have uh, nests or a bone marrow packed with multiple myeloma cells secreting high levels of MMP13, then you have an induction of osteoclasts and the fast development of lytic lesions. What we see when you have a higher amount of multiple myeloma cells in the bone marrow. And just, uh, it's probably worth clarifying that clonal heterogeneity is, is really a, a huge topic in the uh, myeloma uh, field at the moment. It's one of the major barriers to the success of, of treatments for myeloma, and it seems to be the major reason why uh, myeloma typically relapses, even after a complete response, that there are already at the, at the get-go, before the treatment's initiated, a whole variety of different clones some of which are going to be resistant to the treatment that's administered. And so I think these basic insights into myeloma that we are getting from these types of studies are really going to, in the fullness of time, have a major impact on the uh, approach to treatment of the disease. Well, in conclusion, the take-home message here is that despite many, many years of study of the uh, nature and genesis of multiple myeloma, we are still getting really major insights from uh, work that's going on at the moment. And this session really uh, gave us some game-changing insights. The first being that antigen does drive the genesis of multiple myeloma. The second being that the clonal heterogeneity in myeloma is present at baseline before the disease ever becomes cancerous at the stage of MGUS. And the third is that the um, myeloma bone disease is driven by this um, matrix metalloproteinase, MMP13, but it is not dependent on the matrix metalloproteinase activity of that protein.